In tonight's episode, we're going to be looking at six allegedly true eyewitness encounters of mysterious Bigfoot creatures located right in Alberta, Canada, a Canadian province known for its dense woods and deeper mysteries. Without further ado, let's jump into the woods of northern Canada. I had arrived at Waterton National Park from Medicine Hat on the 16th of June in 2011 and had camped for the night at Crandall Campsite that evening, the location of my previous Sasquatch sighting, I believe. This was my first trip to the area, and as I was known to birdwatch, I was up and ready for the first light on the 17th, headed towards Cameron Lake on the road that had just been opened due to excessive snowing. This same area had been recommended to me, as it was a great place for varied thrush and Stellar's jay, two species of bird that I wanted to see. Having seen both species quickly in the lake car park, I switched to look at a scree slope, which was where I told there was a chance of potentially seeing a grizzly bear. I was looking at the slope through my Sorovsky ATM-80 scope and occasionally switching to the top of a local tree to watch a singing male varied thrush. The sighting was just after light, and the sun was still not in view. I had been listening to the very thrush singing in the dark. Now, as I was scanning the scree slope, I noticed movement in a tree line. And as I switched view, I noticed a large animal moving out of the trees and on up to the slope. The slope was to my left on the road leading up to the lake car park, and I had pulled into a lay-by to view. Initial thoughts were, good, grizzly, that was quick. But before I describe what I saw... I should give you some background on myself. I was a complete skeptic when it came to the idea of an undiscovered bipedal ape wandering around the confines of North America. I thought the Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot was simply a man in a gorilla suit, and the photos taken by Todd Standing were all just men dressed as Chewbacca. As a naturalist, I found it inconceivable that Bigfoot could possibly exist and never have been photographed and never any evidence found or perhaps collected for science. The mammal that walked out of the tree line was on two legs. Its movement was fluid and most definitely not a bear walking. It was headed across the slope at a very fast pace, appeared not to be concerned with the scree. At this point, I was in complete shock and looking right at an animal that did not exist. My view was partially blocked by trees as it headed into the slope, so I moved positions quickly, looking at that same animal through my Swarovski AL 10x50 binoculars, leaving my scope where it was standing. I should have used the scope, I know, but the view was good, and I was able to move while looking through my binoculars. It was my movement that probably alerted the creature to my presence, and it moved behind a larger boulder, ducking down as it did so and did not reappear. It either remained where it was or was able to move off without me seeing it. As it walked, its arms were swinging, but not overly so. I was in shock and remained at least for another hour trying to see it leave and talk to myself into me seeing a grizzly and not what it actually was. My distance to the animal is open to interpretation. I seem to remember being only 300 or so meters away, but this might be more. Either way, I was in view of the creature but did not see it look directly at me. I'll try and give you the best description I can. It was large and bulky, perhaps seven and a half feet tall, clearly walked on two legs, dark brown, but much darker than that of local cinnamon black bears. I didn't notice the cone-shaped head or the face, but it did have hair all over the top side and back. It appeared to be scraggy and bulky, like a silverback gorilla, hair covered with scraggy hair and unkempt appearance, large shoulders and pectorals, arms swinging but not overly so, and long, appearing almost bizarrely too long in comparison to be a human. The legs were also short, and it walked with purpose and fluidly, with no difficulty crossing the scree. It ducked down with ease and perhaps onto four feet, or should I dare say two feet and two hands. I left after an hour and headed into Waterton for breakfast. So as I sat there in the cafe... I was desperate to tell somebody, but I did not do so. I've told no one since apart from this and a brief outline of events as I introduced myself as a newer member of a recent organization I joined known as the NAWAC. My family is unaware. 
all three are skeptics and think I'm barking mad as I watch Bigfoot documentaries on TV and YouTube now and devour every book available on the subject. I am now a true believer. I have spent hours talking myself out of this sighting, but have failed to do so. I know what I saw, and I could tell you this was no bear. I'm keen to return to North America and help out on Sasquatch or wood ape expeditions and intend to do so after I retire here in just two years. This was only me, and there seemed to be nobody else in the area, and I was the only one in the entire campsite. So, I was waking up to have breakfast, morning around 6 a.m., it was around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius, clear skies, moon was bright at night, I was in a heavy forested area, lots of brush, fallen trees, the site was right alongside a creek, wildlife is abundant and cattle roam freely, other wildlife spotted were white-tailed deer, mule deer, and fox. Other campers noted moose and bear feces about two kilometers upstream. In fact, the campsite is right on the forestry trunk road. It is called Burnt Timber Recreation Area on the map. Now, when you approach the area driving north, there's a campsite for tents only on the south side of the bridge, and on the north side, there's another site for RVs and tents. I was on the RV side. But anyway, on to the story. On August 9th, 2009... I returned to my campsite at Burnt Timber Recreation Area, building a fire. It was dark, and the time was somewhere around 11 p.m. There was nobody else in the campground I was staying at, and there was no one at the campsite closest to mine. There are two campsites separated by the creek. That evening, while fishing before returning to my campsite, there seemed to be nobody else in my area. I'd been in the area since the previous Friday, and all through the weekend, there was traffic and other campers pretty much everywhere I went, and on my way to return to camp, I didn't see many other vehicles or people for the entirety of the trip. And this is about a 25 to 30 kilometer drive, so as I was sitting at the fire, it should be right around 11 p.m., and I hear a thud-like sound. It was like somebody stomping their foot really hard, and it seemed like it came from a few sites down close to the creek. Now, the creek is below the campsites, but there is a kind of corridor where there are some trails that lead from the sites down and along this corridor. The corridor is also above the creek, but below the campsites. It was the vicinity of the corridor the thud seemed to be coming from. But like I said, a few more sites down, and I immediately thought bear or elk even possibly a moose, as the neighboring campsite the previous night saw a moose just outside the campsite. They mentioned, though, that it made a racket rather than just footsteps. They said it crashed through the brush, breaking branches, and it certainly was not quiet at all until it moved far enough away to hear. The thud that I heard was one and only one, and so I listened intently as I worried specifically about bears, but nothing followed. No branches breaking, no noises... I've heard a bear walk through the woods before, and they aren't exactly delicate walkers. Out of habit, I yelled out to scare any wildlife that may or may not be there, but I heard nothing run off. I heard nothing at all, in fact, except the normal noises of the nature at night. So I continued by the fire, but could not shake the thud noise from my mind, and began to feel an eerie feeling, so I just decided to sleep in my vehicle that night. I was pretty convinced there was something nearby. I woke up early, as it was a pretty uncomfortable sleep, right around 6 a.m., and I could hear a few cows mooing from the distance. So I'm sitting there debating about having breakfast, and out of curiosity, I went looking around to see if I could see anything had been near me, or if I was just fooling myself. I mean, after all, I couldn't see any evidence, so I went to the campsite road and was looking up and down the campsite road, when I heard an unfamiliar sound. It sounded to me like a screech, but not a true one. It was high-pitched, but also resembled yelling. A friend of mine, who's more familiar with Sasquatch, asked if it was like a woman screaming that instantly triggered my memory, and I'm thinking, yes, yes it did. It sounded like that, and it came from the south, or so I believe, the same creek that ran north and south in that section. I could easily check if needed. It was a fair distance off, but very clear and sharp. I have heard many animals in the wild, and it was nothing like what I've heard. The little interest and knowledge I have about Sasquatch and what my friend, who is more familiar than I, have talked about, thought of doing a whoop call, although I have never heard one done. After the whoop call, about five to ten seconds later, 
I heard another scream, but this time it was from the north. Now, this scream was a bit lower pitched and slightly different. When I heard this one, the cows in the area immediately went crazy. They began mooing and I could hear them stampeding. It was quite a loud commotion. In fact, they were mooing so loud and hard, it sounded like a panic moo, like they knew something was in the area that should not be there. The stampede was away from the second scream and tore the campground. The cows actually ended up wandering around the campground. So I tried another call, but nothing. And that's about it. It was a cool experience as I've never heard anything like that. And having an interest in Sasquatch, this experience makes me even more interested. I can't really say it was a Sasquatch, but it certainly is one of my top theories. I guess I should mention the weather too. It was nice the entire weekend, even hot. The days were around 24 to 26 Celsius and evenings down to around 10 to 12. Partly cloudy most mornings, but by the afternoon and evenings, scattered clouds and by nightfall, the skies were clear. On that Sunday, there was a brief thunder shower that rolled through around 4 p.m., but the moon was bright to the point where it was casting shadows each night. I'm still not sure what I heard. This took place in February of 2007, during the week of the 10th to the 17th. Not certain which day now, but at the time, approximately 2 p.m. in the afternoon, myself and a couple of buddies were four-wheeling on a trail in the Wypress Recreation Area, heading from north to south. We were coming up on the first creek crossing, just rounding the corner, and as I was scouting ahead, I noticed that somebody was standing on the trail ahead of us, right across the creek. But there's something wrong, because this person was wearing all dark, seemingly almost reddish clothes, and appeared to have on a big parka. I stopped and was watching this person and saw that it was looking at us, but it was all one color. Now, we're talking about a distance of approximately 400 meters, so there were no discernible features that we noticed other than the one-piece color and no light-colored face like I would have expected. This watching went on for less than a minute, and when it turned its head, it took two strides, disappearing into the densest part of the bush off the trail, heading eastbound. Both my friend and I simply looked at each other and commented on how weird that seemed. Now, what struck me at the time was how smooth those two strides were. They were graceful. They weren't tiring or exhaustive like a human's would be. At the time, I simply chalked it up to being a person as it would have been the first time I would have seen somebody walking around there in the winter. But normally, they stay on the trail. Now, it wasn't until about a month ago after seeing a special on TV about the Sasquatch that it finally hit me. The GPF creature walked the same way this thing did. I haven't really been able to put it out of my mind since then, and there's no doubt that this was unusual at the time, and both my friend and I even commented how weird the behavior was for any person. Now, from my perspective and looking at all the sightings in Alberta, it very well could have been a Sasquatch, unfortunately. We did not look for tracks or any other evidence since we were so weirded out at the time, and, you know, we thought it was a human, but that stride never did strike me right. It simply covered about 20 to 25 feet in two strides. Pretty unrealistic for a human. Also, I'm not that familiar with the woods. I mean, I've traveled and camped from Waterton to past Grand Cache, all along the forestry trunk and side roads for the last 20 plus years, and I've never seen, smelt, heard, stepped in anything that I could say for certain was unknown. After I wrote this story up initially... I and the other witness discussed the event at which time it became clear that he was watching a different animal or person as mine had left the trail to the east and his left to the west. I did not notice his animal, and he did not notice mine. He was parked behind me. I was leading and we were communicating via CB radios. Now, after the fact, I was reading a book by Tom Steinberg, and he relates a story from the 1980s, and after reading it, it occurred to me that this other sighting was less than three kilometers from where we were. Also, there are many sightings around the local lakes, all within 15 kilometers of the same area. On Sunday, February 13th, 2005, I got a call from my brother-in-law. He asked me if he could come out to his property to look at a track in his backyard. So, I arrived shortly with my younger brother, and what we saw was what appeared to be a humanoid footprint right in front of his car. It was a single track because it was in a patch of mud about two feet in circumference. 
Around the mud was a hard, grassy soil. We took measurements, and the track was approximately 10 to 10 and a half inches long. It was about 4 inches wide at the top of the foot and was about 3 inches wide at the heel. The impression was about a half to 1 inch deep. The following is what my brother noted on the piece of paper. Imprint shows mud pushed off to the left side as the subject was pushing off to the foot to move to the right. The imprint also appears to be flat-footed and without garments such as socks or footwear. Big toe seems to be separated from the other toes and all other toes have about a quarter inch gap in between. Footprint is left foot. Time around 7.35 p.m. The date is Sunday, February 13th, 2005. We also took a plaster cast. However, upon extraction of the cast, it came apart. I did manage to salvage all the pieces and glue them together. I have pictures of both and the imprint and the casting for your viewing, but I don't know if you'd be entirely interested. My brother-in-law does not come across as a man who looks for attention, nor is a prankster. In fact, he wishes to not be mentioned at all and does not want any kinds of people accusing him or causing commotion at his house. The reason he called me was that he knew that I was a Sasquatch fanatic, and maybe I could give him some insight from a little knowledge that I have. Don't get us wrong. We're not saying this was a Sasquatch track. We only like to have some sort of answer as to what it could be. If it turns out to be human, then it would be fine. We could leave it alone. It's just a little unusual for a shoeless footprint to be found in the middle of winter. The snow just began to melt, but it was still cold outside, in fact. And when my brother and I had left, it had just begun to blizzard. I heard secondhand stories of sightings and screams heard from others on the reserve in different parts. As a matter of fact, I heard a story about a man being pushed from behind and being partially buried by dirt by a large, hairy black figure a number of years back. Mind you, the man was drunk at the time, but there were other stories as well. I won't go into detail because I'm trying to get the facts for myself as we speak. Anyway, that's my story. I was working as an emergency medical responder in the oil field, sitting on a site for gas, well, work over, near the western end of the Red Rock Road. The job was ending due to spring breakup, and road bands were partially on, preventing the movie of heavy loads during the day. At this time, the partial bands allowed heavy hauls from midnight to about 7 a.m. My consultant had directed that I be the last personnel to aggress. The last low boy on site was having issues with tie-downs and that delayed his departure from location. Until approximately 3.30 a.m., of course. Everybody else had been off the site since 1. I held at location for 20 minutes past the last truck's departure, hoping he would stay far enough ahead of my medical unit to avoid it being peppered by rocks and frozen mud chunks, meaning I entered the Red Rock at approximately 4 a.m., heading in an easterly direction. I had been on the site since 7 the previous day and was going into my 21st hour of being awake. Because of this, I was being extra careful to pay attention to both sides of the road, maintaining a speed of about 30 to 40 kilometers per hour, hoping to give me enough reaction time to break for wildlife, popping out on the road in front of me. There was a fair amount of wildlife after all, deer, elk, lynx, moose, and black bear. I've even encountered a grizzly, slow grazing grass in the ditch by the side of the road in this area before the summer. My MTC, or Mobile Treatment Center, was mounted on the bed by a 2004 2500 Dodge Ram with an extended cab, being powered by diesel. I was keeping the high beams on. The lights were illuminating the entire roadbed, the snow and ice berm, and out another 10 meters both sides of the road. I remember passing the area where the service rigs camp had been set up to the left of the road, thinking it looked pretty empty and deserted. I can make out the area because of the ambient starshine. That, along with the last few centimeters of snow on the ground, helped give the shape and shadow to the snow berms, stumps, trees, and gravel patches of the parking area of the camp. Just a few kilometers past the rig camp site, the Red Rock does a gentle S-curve through a stand of mature timber, running along both sides of the road for approximately 500 meters. After this, Red Rock comes out on a flat area where a road... I believe to be Beaver Road, branched off from the right, heading south. From there, a graded left curve dropped in a wide arc, at about a 4% grade, to cross a single-laned temporary bridge over a creek. After crossing the bridge, the road would swung in an arc to the right, climbing back up out of the creek's floodplain. 
again, at about a 4% grade. Now, I'm pretty short, 5'2", and occasionally, if the grade was steep enough, I would not be able to see the road directly in front of my rig until I started to level out. Because of this, I had slowed down to about 20 kilometers per hour. Now, as I topped the hill coming out of the creek, and I was just about to accelerate, when a solid five-point elk came out from the right side of the road, hopping over the berm and landing not four feet in front of my fender. It scared the stuffings out of me. Breaking hard, I was glad I had slowed down. I then noticed the condition of the elk, though. He takes about two steps, coming to a full stop right in front of my rig. Looking closer at the elk, I could see something wrong. He's clearly winded. His nose is up, almost like he's going to bugle. His antlers are laying almost parallel to the line of his back. His tongue is hanging out of the side of his mouth, where it is clearly visible to me. The eye I can see is rolled back, exposing the sclera. I'm thinking, what the heck? It's not rut. Why would this animal be acting like this? And the elk stood there for three to five seconds panting, then dropping his head into a normal walking position, and he walks slowly to the left side of the road. My experience with elk and deer and roads has always been, if there's one there, there are usually more. So, before I started forward again, I did a check down both sides of the road, looking off as far as my headlights, allowing me to look for any eye shine. And this was when I saw it. The Red Rock, like most gas field roads, had an 80 to 100 meters of clear cut along the right side of the road. This allows for the laying in of a pipeline to carry the gas from the wells to the field to the plant. On this section of red rock, the right of way was cleared of timber, but the tree stumps were still in place, which is the usual condition when the pipe has yet to be laid. The stumps were the gray-brown of the trees that had been dead for several years, and between the starlight, the headlights, and the snow, I could identify stumps and the bottom part of the tree trunks of the standing timber at the back of the clear cut right away. Finishing the scan, I looked forward down the road, and just when I was about to go to drive on, I caught a motion in my peripheral vision on the right. Drawing my attention back to the area, at first, I thought it was just a tall stump as it appeared a bit taller than the other stump nearby, but a slight breeze moved the fur or hair of this taller stump and it sort of shimmered like the hollow tips on a grizzly's coat in the headlights of the truck. Looking closer, I now see what appears to be a round head, but no face visible, and two round, distinct shoulders. The width from the outside shoulder to outside shoulder had to be at least three football helmets wide, or at least one meter. The bulkiness of the shoulders should have been another clue that the shape of this was not a bear. This was kind of my aha moment. And I'm now thinking, I now know what was making the elk run. A bear, and by its coloring a grizzly. I feel the puzzle has now been solved satisfactorily, and start to move forward. That's when it stands up on two legs. And when I say it stands, what it does is unfolds in a smooth and easy motion. There's no swaying, no side to side in the way that a bear does to keep in a standing position. I'm still thinking grizzly bear, though, based on the estimated distance from the side of the road, about probably 10 to 12 meters. The brightness of the area being lit by the high beams and how the upper part of the standing form fades into darkness. I would guesstimate the height to be around 8 feet tall. It turns its upper body towards the east, and even though I cannot see a face, I get the feeling it is looking further down the road in the direction I'm headed. I have the impression of a head, but... It's tall enough that the upper third of the body kind of fades off into the darkness, that being only slightly a different dark than the standing timber, several more meters behind the form. Think dark bluish black for trees and dark blackish brown for the upper part of the creature. My next surprise is when it drops its arms. The left arm is long enough that I could see the range of motion shape and the large shape of a hand in the light of the high beams. This is why I say arms. It was a hand and not a paw. It was very distinctive. The arm was longer and the hand was lower than where a human hand would rest beside a human thigh. I'm beginning to be overwhelmed by a feeling of dis-ease, like I should not be sitting still and that I really should start driving away from this creature. My heart is now racing because it's clear this is not a grizzly bear. My hair is on end and I think, oh my god... As I start to carefully forward, half expecting to see another one step up onto the road, it takes a few minutes to think, but I believe I have just seen a Sasquatch. From the time I braked for the elk for me to see this thing, it was probably no more than 20 to 25 seconds.
We were herding our cows home at night. They had got out of the pasture and were walking to the west heading into the wind. We were near the edge of a ravine that came out of the endless bush, about a mile away. The ravine is thickly treed. All of a sudden, the cows take off running to a skirt around a granary building, holding grain, right near the edge of the ravine, and our dog whined once and took off at a run towards home, a half mile away. The three of us, running close to the cows, cut across in front of the granary to cut off the cows, and as we raced around the building, we came out in front and straight into a huge man-like animal covered in fur. It was after dark, but the moon had rose early, and the light-colored oat or barley stems in the field, I don't remember which crop, really made things brighter. The animal had grain in its hand and just stared at us for about five seconds, looked as surprised as we did. My oldest brother quickly said, I know that's you, Walter Luca, in my dad's bear suit. Now, Walter Luca was a neighbor that had lived about three miles away and was huge, like 6'4", weighed about 400 plus pounds. The animal then turned around and quickly walked off into the bush about 40 yards away. When we got home, we immediately checked in our dad's bear suit. They were brown coveralls made of wool and made for very cold weather. Well, it was still hanging there. My dad was still not back from hunting moose. I was eight at the time and my brothers were 10 and 14. We began talking about it at home and we realized that it had reached in to get the grain from the silo at the very end, which was about eight and a half feet off the ground. We were called that the animal, which looked like a man, was almost as tall as the gable ends of the granary, or eight feet high. Our father was in the logging business and had several natives working for him, and a few months later, we were there talking to them, and they said it was a Sasquatch. That is the first time we had ever heard the word, but it was used commonly years later as several people in North Alberta saw these same animals. Several other people have seen Sasquatches since then, some have pictures of their tracks, others have heard them and seen them, and as well as seen their tracks. This is over a 30-year period, but in the last 10 years alone, I've talked to well over 40 people who personally claim to have seen them, including one friend that actually bade one for a few moments with his cougar hounds, but got his wind and quickly raced off. It was tossing his dogs 30 feet. He recovered his dogs the next day, all bruised and battered, worn out nearly 45 miles away. If you guys enjoyed tonight's episode, be sure to hit that like button and leave a comment down below. Also, if you guys enjoy the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button and keep your notifications on so this way YouTube will let you know every time I release a fantastic new piece of content. As always, guys, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you all in the very next video.